Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Nutritional Revolution podcast. It's Kyla here, and we have a super rad guest for you guys. We have Dr. Krauss in the house. <laughs> I told her I was going to say that, but Dr. Emily Krauss, you guys, she's a clinical assistant professor at Stanford's Children's Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Center. She's a very knowledgeable got a, got a brain on her for sure. I mean, we're going to talk about all kinds of things, but she specializes in physical medicine and rehab and sports medicine. And she's involved with the healthy runner project as well as faster. Many of you may have seen that on the socials. It's got tons of great nuggets of information. So we're going to dive into all that. And not only that, she has past experience and current experience. She has run nine marathons, including Boston twice, and she's done a 50 K. And I know she also does some mountain biking and gravel riding as well. So thank you so much, Emily, for joining us. Kyla, thanks for having me. Um, that's what I get for sharing a tidbit before we recorded about yeah. my, <laughs> my middle school student council campaigns of houses yeah. in the house, but it yeah. does stick and it's nice and catchy, but I'm glad and I'm glad to be here, excited to be here and um, be on this podcast. All right, Emily, how did you get into this field? What brought your interest into this area? Yeah, so I like to talk about my roots, which are, in, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska called Holdridge and oh, cool. grew up in a really active family. So um, I just learned to appreciate the value of movement and physical activity at a pretty young age. And I knew pretty early on that I wanted to do something in the health science world. In middle school, I loved my science classes. Awesome. And eventually it came to the point where I did some shadowing in high school and was able to shadow an orthopedic surgeon. Nice. So I was on this track. I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic sports medicine physician, and um, treat athletes and active um, motivated individuals. And then realized that orthopedics wasn't for me. I, I really liked that um, human engagement. I'm a little more of a kind of head to toe view, take a more preventative approach and um, didn't want to just kind of go down that kind of more surgical route and procedural route. And I found the field of physical medicine and rehab and sports medicine. And I was like, yes, this is for me. That's and awesome. Yeah. So that was kind of how I, how I found um, sports medicine. And then um, kind of through that time it evolved into a little bit more of a focused endurance um, sports medicine um, area of, of interest for me. Amazing. And were you doing any cycling or running during all of this period as well? Yeah. So as a, as a kid, I played all the sports. I did tennis and um, golf, did some dabbled in softball and volleyball and basketball and then in middle school, got into cross country, ran in high school, just cross country. And then I played basketball wow. and tennis as my other sports, which I actually nice. think was um, pretty protective. And maybe we'll talk about the, the benefits yeah. of multi-sport participation and multi-directional movement patterns on bone health. Um, but looking back, um, it was it's really great for me. In college, I ran on my own. Awesome. And then um, in med school, I joined a, a club team. Um, it was called Team Nebraska Brooks. And I started to get a little bit more competitive ran my first marathon in college, kind of self-coach, like the traditional, like download a, a running plan online and try nice. and coach yourself through it. And I, I made all the mistakes. I, I trained way too much um, and didn't really diversify my, my running enough. Mm. And then once I got to residency at Stanford, I finally got a coach. Um, I, a coach actually reached out to me, which oh. um, was um, Dr. or was David Roach, Megan Roach's husband. Okay. And he was like, I, I'd love to coach you. And I was like, yeah. I would love a coach. And yeah. that really helped um, get me in a more focused training program. Um, awesome. I took more rest days and it yeah. was, and then eventually got into cycling um, as kind of a, a cross training piece because yeah. we're in the Bay area. You can't, you can't avoid it around here. Yes. There's cycling everywhere. Yes, I know we have, we are very lucky that our access to cycling, it's pretty incredible and our weather too, I think for the most part, you can get out a vast majority of the year pretty easily. So, I mean, one of the big reasons we bought, brought you onto the podcast today is we have many clients and athletes, definitely a lot of our runners, it seems like for sure, but end up having stress fractures or loss of menstrual cycle. And, um, I'd love to kind of go down the path of like, what is Leah and what is, um, FAT or, um, red S or those kind of things for our listeners. And I mean, I guess 
I don't know where the best, best place to start is, but c- could you maybe explain like those things? And then we can kind of maybe go down of what causes them and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I really like to start at the basics to make sure that our foundation is set before we yes. go kind of deep into um, the weeds with some of the other details. And um, I agree with you, a lot of my patients. And so my, like, I have a split between a, a clinical practice and a research practice, which mm. I'll talk a lot more about the research later, but yeah. A lot of my clinical practice, I see um, younger athletes um, at mm-hmm. Stanford Children's. I do see some adults mm-hmm. and a lot of them are presenting with bone stress injuries or irregular periods or amenorrhea, loss mm-hmm. of period. And wow. so I go into this st- discussion a lot as far as, all right, do you understand what low energy availability means? Mm-hmm. And so kind of starting there, because I think that's a good foundation, yeah. um, low energy availability can occur. And um, we'll kind of talk about athletes um, specifically when an athlete is either under fueling, um, this could be both intentional. They're trying to either cut weight, lose weight, or mm-hmm. um, there may be even some degree of disordered eating or mm-hmm. a more um, severe eating disorder at play, mm-hmm. or it can be from um, just overtraining too. Mm-hmm. And, or so the under, sorry, the low energy availability um, from under, under fueling can also be inadvertent too. Mm-hmm. So they may just be unintentionally increasing their training volume and not really realizing that they need to match those energy needs with, with better fueling or more strategic fueling throughout the day. And so I see a wide range of low energy availability present. Um, Mm -hmm. most of the time it's a little bit later on and Mm -hmm. there's kind of a combination of maybe unintentional or inadvertent, but also this maybe underlying, um, body image kind of complex that Mm -hmm. a lot of athletes get that can be really hard to work out of, especially yeah. um, with social media in your face all the time with yeah. pressure to look a certain way, to be, to be a runner, to be an athlete. And that could be this un- can be an unnecessary pressure for a lot of athletes. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. That low energy availability over time can lead to um, suppression of certain hormones circulating throughout the body mm-hmm. kind of starting in the brain. And most of those um, hormones are are actually down regulated um a couple mm-hmm. are up regulated but the down regulated hormones can be sex hormones like mm-hmm. estrogen testosterone different thyroid hormones different growth hormones and over time in females that can lead to um irregular periods mm-hmm. um be in a young athlete a delay in um, her first period in males it's a little bit more complicated um where they have hormonal suppression that can affect um, their sex drive and mm-hmm. lead to um, a, a lack of morning erections. Mm. So um, we see that piece of hormonal suppression. And then over time, that hormonal suppression can cause um, effects on bone turnover or bone remodeling. And these athletes who are doing a, engaging in a lot of repetitive activities, um, such as as running. So you're you're touching the ground many times on a run, yeah. a marathon, an ultra marathon. And if that bone remodeling is altered because of that hormonal suppression, that can lead to a bone stress injury or overuse injury Mm -hmm. to the bone from a stress Mm -hmm. reaction or to a full stress fracture where there's an actual fracture line. Yeah. Wow. So in your clinical practice, do you, I would imagine people probably don't come to you and say, I think I have Leah, but maybe they present, like you're saying, with a stress fracture or loss of the menstrual cycle. And then how how does one determine that they do in fact have low energy availability? Yeah. Yeah. It's some, to some degree. And I was just chatting with this um, expert. Um, she's a gynecologist who is so sharp and she, um, wow. we're doing a, we're doing a webinar tomorrow on menstrual, Amazing. menstrual cycle 101. Oh my goodness. And, and uh, she may raise a really good point that um, if somebody's presenting with um irregular periods or missed period, Mm -hmm. um, low energy availability is in the differential or in the list of potential causes, Mm -hmm. but it should be a diagnosis of exclusion, which means Mm -hmm. other factors should be ruled out first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so with that, I usually do get different, um, lab work, um, for athletes and I check their thyroid. I, I check their, um, some different sex hormones, and if those are suppressed, in addition to some of this other information, um, I can come to the conclusion that it's low energy availability, but you got to rule out the other stuff. You got to rule out yeah. pregnancy. Yes. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Good so point. <laughs> combination as far as kind of the, the workup. And it really kind of takes um, a little bit of clinical suspicion, mm-hmm. but also um, additional information. Yeah. And kind of talking about losing a cycle or not having a cycle. 
I have to bring up like contraception. So, or oral contraception or hormonal, um, do you get people coming to you where maybe they have a stress fracture, but they don't think that they are messing up their hormones because they're having a bleed while they're on hormonal contraception? Yes. Interestingly, not as much as I used to. I think mm-hmm. athletes are are getting more aware and educated about um, being on hormonal contraception and how it can mask mm-hmm. um, this low energy availability state. But these athletes who are on hormonal contraception, is like such as the birth control pill, where they have this period of a bleed or mm-hmm. what I kind of call a, a withdrawal bleed. Um, that's from, it can be from, well, it's from an unnatural cause because you're taking an outside hormone, but, um, at that point, it's hard to really distinguish or tease out whether there is a low energy availability, um, phenomena or Mm -hmm. a a cause to, um, this almost, um, underlying hormonal suppression. Wow. Yeah. So it can be, it can be tough, um, with athletes that are on hormonal contraception because they don't have that just natural indicator of a menstrual cycle every month. But I, um, at that point I have a conversation with the athlete and like, why are you on hormonal contraception? Is there a possibility that we could, um, go off for a period of time? If, if not, then we really need to work closely with, um, a, a dietitian or someone to work through that, that nutritional piece to make yeah. sure that there is a, an energy balance. Right. Yeah. Wow. And thinking about kind of the, um, gosh, the suppression of hormones. So you mentioned thyroid. I've seen many clients who they're on, they get put on thyroid medication. And is this something where when someone can get themselves out of a state of low energy availability, do they then need to like taper off their thyroid medication? Do they, do those hormones come back? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say that it's, it's, it depends. And it's a little complicated. Um, Mm -hmm. I have worked with athletes who definitely have like a primary or central thyroid disease or dysfunction Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. on top of low energy availability. So that's complicated. And the low energy availability is going to affect potentially their dosage and Mm -hmm. even just their reaction and how they feel on the medication. Um, but what does frustrate me is when an athlete may get placed on, um, thyroid replacement, maybe a little bit too early before Mm -hmm. the low energy availability is addressed Mm -hmm. Uh, because oftentimes that that total T3 um, is down-regulated um, with low energy availability for a period of time. And sometimes that's like my early detector, even before mm. nothing may have um, more significant menstrual dysfunction or yeah. um, irregular periods. Um, for an ex- for example, an athlete may notice like, okay, my periods are a little bit shorter, a little bit lighter, but I didn't really think much of it. And then we get some additional information or like, oh, this um, the thyroid is suppressed let's tackle this and try and nip it before it gets um, more, more severe. Mm -hmm. And to answer your other question, as far as kind of balancing back out the thyroid function, I mean, I think it depends how long an athlete's been on thyroid replacement. Uh, I think it's something that that athlete shouldn't just stop on, on his or her own. Um, and to make sure that he or she is working with a, um, a physician, ideally a specialist an endocrinologist to make sure that um, they're tapering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be pretty incredible if someone didn't, if they could get back to a place, right. Where they didn't hopefully need to take that. If it's not like you're saying, a, um, an actual like autoimmune condition or disease on, on the level of the thyroid. Yes. So what are some of the things that someone should pay attention to that might be signs that they are experiencing low energy availability? If it's an unintentional situation, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think kind of circling back, um, to kind of finish out the whole definition breakdown. Um, so I kind of talked about the female athlete triad, which is Mm -hmm. the low energy availability affecting, um, affecting some degree of hormonal suppression or causing hormonal suppression, such as irregular periods Mm -hmm. in a male that can be other, um, hormonal dysfunction, such Mm -hmm. as, um, lack of erections, morning Mm -hmm. erections, and then that affecting overall um, bone health. So that's the triad, those three. Okay. And then um, expanding on that is relative energy deficiency in sport, um, which goes beyond just the, the triad to um, show all of the health and performance consequences mm. of low energy availability. And that's where you can start to think about, all right, what are some other signs beyond just a missed period or a lack of a morning erection? Um, because I really believe those are a little bit later in the game mm-hmm. as far as 
more prolonged hormonal suppression and more prolonged low energy veil, low energy state mm-hmm. or um, energy deficit. So things such as, um, I think irritability, mm. fatigue, a lot more general symptoms that could be mm-hmm. from a lot of things like, yeah. Sports. But I do see athletes say they may have some just um, just sub-performance or drops in their performance or mm-hmm. just not really hitting those times um, like like they were before. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, I would say the irritability, the fatigue are also um, some other symptoms that are just, um, they may not even notice because it's kind of a slow transition Yeah, from, from where their kind of baseline is. Yeah. Would someone always present with weight loss if they have low energy availability? Oh, that's a good question. And I think, um, it's a lot of athletes think they're like, well, my weight's the same. My weight's been stable. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't have reds. Mm-hmm. I'm fine. And a lot of these athletes, because of that change in thyroid function and suppression of um, thyroid hormones, their metabolism slows. And mm-hmm. so their weight may not, they may not lose any weight or yeah. they, they may dip and then um, kind of normalize. But I think what is consistent with those athletes is they usually, even though they're at that same weight, they may feel a lot more fatigued and just feel mm-hmm. off at that weight. And, and it can take time for that, um, that athlete to reset and yeah. get that metabolism back um, working at kind of full function. Yeah. Do you in particular out of curiosity, see when individuals are in a state of low energy availability, do you ever notice whether it's focused more towards one macronutrient or another? Ooh, yeah. There's some good research on low carbohydrate availability. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, unfortunately I see a lot of my endurance athletes, especially young, young teenage endurance athletes, but I would say across the board, we're not getting enough carbohydrates throughout the day and they're under carving. And I'm like, no, carbohydrates are so important um, for your sport, especially format at your best. So I'd say, um, carbs, especially are these, some of these athletes are unfortunately carbophobic yeah. and sometimes it's, sometimes it's culture within, within the mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a, a family member is restricting, um, carbs for, um, dietary purposes and, and that athlete is doing the same, but mm-hmm. you have to remind these athletes that you are functioning at such a high level and your, your engine needs that needs that fuel and the best fuel is, um, for especially like pre-workout, um, are those carbohydrates. Yeah. I think I love the touching on the faster stuff. I know we'll get there, but her, the faster posts that you guys have been posting on social or Instagram, those I think are, you guys do an excellent job of like putting that into like simple terms that I think are easy to interpret. And, um, I mean, part of that may be trying to, to get like, well, I think breaking down the science in an understandable form for anybody is really helpful, but definitely if it's a younger audience to those, you know, high school athletes and stuff like that, I think that's a really smart move there and it helps a lot of people, but I know I've seen some carb stuff in there. So again, promoting the faster Instagram, you guys have to check it out. Um, and that's F A S T R. There's not an E at the end. there. So (laughs) So check that out. Um, so why explain to our audience why it's important to not put yourself in like a, a state of low energy availability? What are some things that, or, you know, that can be sacrificed? I know we talked about menstrual cycle, but, um, maybe in regards to bone health and stuff like that, why would we want to not put ourselves in a state of low energy availability? And why would we want to get out of that state? Yeah. Um, the, I love like the reds diagram that goes through all this breakdown of both like health and performance. And I think, um, kind of starting with, with bone health, um, there's a lot of really quality research that shows prolonged hormonal suppression, um, can affect, um, like I was saying, the bone turnover and bone remodeling, um, rates and, Mm -hmm. um, hormonal suppression actually increases bone breakdown and decreases bone formation. Mm. And so that increases the risk of overall um, stress fracture or bone stress injury um, risk. But it also over time can affect um, just pro- overall bone mineral density and bone health. Mm-hmm. And especially in a younger athlete, um, kind of getting into like that, those adolescent athletes, like that's their peak bone building time. And mm-hmm. they're, they're, rapid growth and peak um, growth velocity is happening in those adolescent years. And they can acquire up to 90% of their overall bone mineral density, bone mineral wow. content during that, like the, during, by age 20. Oh my goodness. Wow. So I, I really emphasize to these athletes, like 
you need to put bone coins in the bone bank because yeah. <laughs> this is going to be like the big time where yeah. you can um, really, really build up bones. Mm -hmm. And that's, and a lot of that's through nutrition. Mm -hmm. Some of it's through genetics. Um, and some of it's also through the types of sports that they're um, involved in. So yeah. a swimmer, I would recommend doing more land-based therapy and strength training and some plyometrics just to kind of help stimulate bone growth, mm -hmm. uh, during, um, even those times when their sport is completely non-impact. Yeah, that's great. And when you say um, land-based plyometrics, does strength training count? Does, you know, um, oh goodness, jump rope, like give us some examples. What does that look yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, a great question. So um, strength training, um, like plyometric jumping. So like <laughs> any type of um, single leg hops, mm. uh, box jumps, Yeah. Uh, or if an athlete likes to play soccer or other multi-directional sports like basketball, mm -hmm. I think that can be really valuable too. Maybe yeah. they're like, I don't want to do like a, a structured workout for 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, then I'd say, well, maybe, um, you can like play some pickup soccer with some friends, um, awesome. or, or other sports. You don't have to be like the starting the yeah. starter and in, in every, on every team, um, but really do it for fun. And I think it's, it's really good to just kind of diversify sports and, and also avoid burnout. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, I love that suggestion as well. So, um, a little bit still on menstrual cycle, and then I do want to dive into some of your studies and research you've published, but, um, what, what is your consensus and thoughts on if someone does have low bone mineral density and the effects of an oral contraceptive versus like an estrogen patch? Like where, where are your thoughts on that right now? Yeah. Um, unfortunately athletes can sometimes be placed on hormonal contraception or the birth control pill mm -hmm. to, um, quote unquote, using air quotes to help their bones. Yeah. And there is more research and even just a recent review out that shows that hormonal or oral contraceptive pills do not improve bone mineral density. So it's mm -hmm. not an effective way mm -hmm. uh, to address low bone mineral density or to mm -hmm. help um, just overall bone health with an athlete who's maybe recovering from a bone stress injury. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was really helpful to almost solidify those recommendations a bit more, yeah. and even help practitioners um, when they're prescribing um, hormonal replacement yeah. um, for an athlete. However, for an athlete who's had low energy availability for a period of time and is really doing the work, trying to address the um, nutritional deficits, ideally working with a sports dietitian, looking at um, just overall nutrient intake and then mm -hmm. kind of the macro and um, micronutrients as well. Um, so they're, they've been working on that for a period of time yeah. um, without a lot of improvement or even just resumption or return mm -hmm. of menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. and at that point, um, thinking about other types of hormonal replacement, like the transdermal estrogen patch, mm -hmm. you take that with um, cyclic progestin, mm -hmm. um, has been shown to improve bone mineral density um, in a couple of, in some studies. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's something um, I don't often prescribe it. I usually, mm -hmm. it's a let's try ABC and really work yeah. hard on that and then check in in six months, 12 months. And if still, still no luck, even though that athlete is doing the work, then we'll talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Options. Wow. Yeah. I think that's an area that, um, I mean, I just became aware of, um, I think it was one of, was it Catherine Ackerman's maybe at the female, um, the conference. The conference. Yeah, yeah. The athlete. Yeah. That they do every two years. Um, when she mentioned that, I was like, my brain was like, you know, like, yeah. yeah. Cause for so long, I mean, it's like, what, what is the difference there from an oral versus the, the patch? And is it, is it the estrogen form that's in it or is it the way that it's being absorbed? Do we, mm -hmm. do we know what's. Yeah. The yeah. So, um, with the oral contra oral con contraceptive pill, it goes <laughs> through, um, this first pass metabolism through the liver or mm -hmm. hepatic metabolism. And through that, it actually downregulates specific hormones like insulin growth factor oh. and other, other important hormones that are actually beneficial for bone health. Yeah. And the transdermal estrogen patch doesn't do that. It doesn't bite. It doesn't go oh. through the metabolism. So fascinating. So fascinating. I love that. I love that explanation. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, if someone has low, or I should say, if someone has low energy availability and they've lost their menstrual cycle, is it just as simple as increasing calories? And I ask you this because I've had this question asked to me before, 
or can someone, is there a certain supplement or something that someone could take that will help get their cycle back? Yeah. There's not like this quick fix, like supplement that is just like the magic pill or the magic drink um, that's going to, to make all the difference. Um, We did mention uh, really focusing on carbohydrate intake. So I think within as you're addressing just overall energy intake and increasing caloric intake, that might also um, involve um, decreasing activity for a period of time if that athlete really just can't hit those those numbers. But um, it can be done without addressing activity level, which I think is important, especially if an athlete's really at that competitive competitive state wants to maintain training. Mm-hmm. I do think it needs to be pretty calculated. Yeah. Um, really addressing within day energy deficits too. So it's not even just like what at the end of the day, um, the athlete has consumed throughout that day, mm-hmm. making sure that they're not, um, not doing any type of intermittent fasting mm-hmm. or not. There's not a prolonged, um, fasting state or a deficit throughout the day between like breakfast and lunch or lunch and dinner, mm-hmm. um, especially if they're doing multi, like a workout and then like a lift that they're really mm-hmm. trying to fuel their body throughout those times. Yeah. Other things like, um, making sure that they're not taking in too much fiber. Cause mm-hmm. I feel like that can actually, um, kind of satiate them and uh, make them feel full faster, which yeah. in this case, we really want them to have more energy dense or, um, mm-hmm. more dense nutrients. And so those are kind of some of the, the recommendations that you can do beyond just addressing the um, kind of increase in the overall intake throughout the day. Yeah. I love what you mentioned about fiber too, because we, we've also had clients, a lot of like type A, these, these high performing athletes where I think they take the information from the media where it's like, eat veggies, we need more veggies, you know, and then they really hone in on tons of maybe not even so much fruits, just tons of veggies. Mm -hmm. And again, they put themselves in a state where we do see definitely not enough carbs, not enough overall energy, but again, fiber. I mean, I had an athlete come to me, we did a nutrient analysis and her fiber was, I think it was like in the 60 plus grams a day. And yeah. So I mean, with some, a lot of fiber, (laughs) yeah, like wild amounts of fiber. So, I mean, with something like that, um, I think RDA for women, I want to say is like 2025 and men is 30, 35. I mean, do you, do you have a cutoff? Do you stick with RDA or what do you guys suggest for the fiber? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, definitely not going beyond or exceeding that and maybe Mm -hmm. dialing back a little bit on the RDA. Yeah. Um, I think RDAs are hard because it's like, what does an athlete need versus, um, you know, how that was maybe recommended for, Mm -hmm. um, a less or kind of moderately active individual, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's really important to think about. And one other piece that I think is important too, as you're kind of going through all of this, um, low energy availability, um, management is, is trying to think about all the other stressors in that person's life and Mm -hmm. addressing those stressors, trying to eliminate stressors with when possible. Sometimes it's hard to eliminate if you're juggling all the things and 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 a parent and working, but, um, making sure that, that's factored in to, to the calculation yeah. because that extra stress is just going to be working that body. And, um, that body is going to be exerting that much more, um, effort and energy. And yeah. that energy is going to be not going to be able to be used to help normalize or kind of get that hormonal profile back at to, into the level that that athlete needs. Yeah. I think that's great. And how, just one final question on that. How would someone know what their bone density is? How, how should someone test that? Oh yeah. Yeah. So bone mineral density, um, clinically, um, how we test it is through a DEXA scan, which stands for dual energy X-ray absorptiometry. Um, and that is, um, a type of imaging study that, um, is technically the gold standard um, to measure um, bone health. It does have its limitations, but you can um, get bone mineral density measurements and Mm -hmm. those are uh, reported out as um, Mm Z-scores, which we use um, in in um, in premenopausal women and and men. And that Z-score is age matched and sex matched. So we compare that and we want athletes um, above negative one. Mm-hmm. And that's different than the osteoporosis definitions. Mm-hmm. I think it's important for an athlete to, to know how to interpret the DEXA results too. Mm-hmm. And we think about an athlete who's engaging in weight-bearing activity should have stronger bones and um, 
higher bone mineral density or higher Z scores than um, those compar- comparative, like those normative values. Yeah. Do you see if someone has put themselves in a place where their bone mineral density is, maybe they show up with or present with a stress fracture and de- bone density is low. Can someone, if they're over now 20 and they maybe didn't put those coins in the bank, the bone coins, mm-hmm. can they get those back? You know, I've seen improvements, more modest improvements. Mm -hmm. And in those scenarios, I'm like, okay, how can we hold on to what you got? Mm -hmm. And how may, or how should you potentially modify your loading and your training Mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't overload these potentially a little more compromised bones? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that they, they can't run or that they can't um, run this marathon, but They may need to incorporate more rest days or do more um, cross training and um, cycling as part of their, their training. Mm -hmm. And we see that. And we even see some athletes um, doing the alter G or anti-gravity treadmill Mm -hmm. as part of their um, training program um, due to just potentially compromised bone health. Well, yeah. Awesome. I think that's super helpful. Do you, um, I know in the Bay area, we have there's a company, I don't know if I should say the name, but there's a company that does public DEXA testing, but it's more geared towards body fat composition. Um, They do give a DEXA reading in a Z-score, but how does that compare if someone goes to their doctor and gets a DEXA? Yeah, I think um, you need to be really careful about um, the machine that's being used, making Mm -hmm. sure, um, especially for young athletes, that it's Mm -hmm. a pediatric DEXA, Mm -hmm. there's different um, reporting and software that's used to to report that out. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the time we've, I have um, have a DEXA expert that I, that I go to and she kind of gives me the sign off on different machines. And she's like, this is a good spot. This, I'm not sure it's a little more based on the what's on their website. They don't list um, the machine. Oh my goodness. And yeah. So those, those things. Um, and, and a lot of it is like, you pick up the phone and you call them and you inquire about this and hopefully they have um, all that information, but it just may not be as like publicly available. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I don't think, um, cause with it, with the Dexter, with your doctor, doctor, they're looking at three parts of the body, right. Oh, it, right. Versus mm-hmm. like the Dexa here. I don't think for the body fat testing, they're not segmenting out, you know, femur pelvis, like they're not doing that yeah. as far as I can see. Um, so I was curious how they're, how, you know, how accurate that is in comparison, but yeah, for, for DEXAs. Yeah. If we wanted to kind of talk about just briefly the anatomy, mm-hmm. I like to look at lumbar spine, mm-hmm. DEXA Z scores, and then, um, the, the total hip mm. and, and femoral neck. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes those reports don't, don't, provide those, those specific analyses. Yeah. And that, especially if it's more of like a body composition testing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if they're, yeah, if they're taking like the whole body or how they're even assessing it, but yeah, it could be interesting to shoot them a message and figure out (laughs) how accurate it is. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Um, so let's see, I want to make sure we get, get some of our good questions in here. So I know you mentioned you've done a study on the Western States ultra runners, and I was wondering if we could kind of dive into that and, um, talk about maybe why you guys wanted to do the study. What did you specifically look at and what did you find? Yeah. So we have been fortunate um, at Stanford and then with some of our collaborators, one at um, UC Davis, um, Mm -hmm. Tracy Haig, um, Dr. Megan Roach, Mm -hmm. um, to work on, work with the Western States Research Foundation on um, an ultramarathon study, looking at bone health and potential, um, the female athlete triad and just overall determinants of bone health. Yeah. And so we've done this over three years. Um, The first year we actually, um, as part of our, our study, we, we did DEXA scans. Um, mm-hmm. So kind of going back to that, we did yeah. DEXA scans um, awesome. with these portable portable machines um, yeah. that we worked through, actually worked with um, Body Spec. Oh, with. nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, we worked and we worked with our DEXA specialist, DEXA expert. Nice. And, um, they used um, the machines that we can, that are kind of compatible with our, our anal- analysis. Perfect. Yeah. And then we recruited athletes and we um, had them fill out a pretty lengthy survey on um, their fueling habits, a menstrual cycle history, injury history. And then um, we got the DEXA and then years two and three, we also did um, lab draws. Mm. And so we were looking at just like prevalence, like how common are certain triad risk factors, how common um, are 
um, is injury history in these athletes. And then we also kind of as a secondary analysis looked at different associations between mm -hmm. triad risk and um, these other hormonal um, changes and horm mm -hmm. um, these other biomarkers. Okay. And we got testosterone, estradiol, vitamin D, ferritin. Mm -hmm. And I think that is it. I'm awesome. trying to pull up. I actually have like the slides because I was nice. like, just no. <laughs> ask me. I'm going to make sure that I don't misquote everything. Yeah. So kind of the big takeaways, um, as far as like tr overall triad risk, um, and these were all through self-report as well as taking okay. that information from the DEXA scan. So the triad risk score that we used combines that, um, uses the bone mineral density test to, um, as an indicator of overall bone health. Mm -hmm. And we found that 36% of men, and we had about 45 men and 33 women enrolled over those um, three years. Wow. 36% um, of men and 55% of women were at moderate or high risk for wow. the triad based on this um, cumulative, cumulative risk score that we used. Mm. We found that low energy availability, um, which was kind of their self-reported score was um, that category was that the highest um, risk factor wow. or contributor to that. Um, with 37% of men and 53% of women in moderate or high risk categories for low wow. energy availability. And um, nearly half of those participants reported trying to lose weight for performance, mm. which in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but I think you have to be really careful, especially in an endurance athlete yeah. about cutting weight for um, his or her sport and the mm -hmm. potential hormonal implications of that. Yeah. And then we found as far as bone health that 26% of men and 18% um, of women were at moderate or high risk for low bone mineral density, wow. which we found interesting. Um, we did have more, more men enrolled in the study. So that mm. may have been kind of and less women. So that may have skewed the, the results a little mm. bit, mm -hmm. but um, it was still interesting to see kind of that higher level, um, yeah. men a little bit higher than um, the average reporting um, bone mineral density. Hmm. Um, incidence or prevalence rates. And then also looking at bone stress injury, 22% of men and 36% of women, um, had a history of at least one or more bone stress injuries. Wow. So I think it's just this like reminder that, I mean, running is an, in, an injurious sport mm -hmm. athletes get injured and yeah. it's kind of a matter of how can we decrease that second, decrease the risk of that second injury, that third injury, because mm -hmm. I think that cycle can really um, affect an athlete's ability to come to bounce back. Yeah. Um, I think so it's those some of the big um, kind of just overall risk, risk profile. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's fascinating. And I think too, with a lot of endurance athletes, I mean, especially ultra <laughs> Western States, I mean, these people are putting in tons of hours every week and to be able to match your nutrition to something like that, or your energy intake too, is, um, it's challenging, especially with running. We find many of our runners have a suppression of appetite posts, you know, so that's a tricky area too, I think, to try and encourage people to get something in when they're not, their body's telling them they're not hungry. So, yeah. And just like all the GI disturbances and GI mm -hmm. upset. And, and so I think that's, that's hard to navigate. And yeah, a lot of credit to all nutrition experts trying to find ways and strategies to mm -hmm. for an athlete to, to fuel and refuel properly. Yeah. When they can't keep something down. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's, scary. it's an unfortunate part for sure that some people have to experience the on course. It's uh, I have had many athletes tell me about things they've seen with the you know, whether it's vomiting or having to run to the restroom, you know, constantly it's, um, yeah, if we can figure out how to keep, keep the energy in and utilize yeah. it, um, we can obviously get a lot farther. So yeah, I think that's important. So I know we're getting close on time. So I definitely want to make sure we have enough time to talk about the faster program. So tell us what, what is it? When did it start? What's the goal with that? share, share the goods with us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, it's all kind of like a build up to faster because it's, it's the work, it's the education, it's mm -hmm. the research. Um, it's all, all that we're a part of, yeah. um, but faster, um, stands for female athlete science and translational research. So awesome. no E F A S T R. Yeah. 
And um, it's a research initiative um, that we're in collaboration with Harvard and mm. um, Boston Children. So Dr. Ackerman is yeah. a close collaborator with us and um, a really good mentor and colleague of mine. Awesome. And this is part of and supported by the Wusai Human Performance Alliance, mm. which, um, you know, our focus or the, the alliance's focus is, is on uncovering the biological principles that govern human performance. Mm. And, and so our focus is really trying to close that gap in female athlete research um, through doing the good research, but also um, another big focus of ours is to translate that information to athletes. Yeah. Um, hence why we just, we have a strong social media push and um, a big shout out to our research coordinators, Abby McIntyre and Ellie Diamond, because awesome. they're doing a lot of those quick hitter um, social media posts. Nice. And um, Dr. Megan Roach, my um, our lead researcher, and I review the information, but our coordinators are so on it right now that oftentimes we're like, no notes, this looks great. Awesome. Go ahead and post. <laughs> and, and that's super fun. And yeah. it's really interesting to kind of get the get the response from athletes. Mm -hmm. We're like, we want more of this information. How can we yeah. get involved? And um, how can we, we want you to study this age group or mm -hmm. um, this particular athlete or like postpartum yeah. athlete return to sport. And it's like, great, we're, we're working on it, but yes. we're this team and we have to, to some degree, stay focused on yeah. projects that we're, we're working on right now. Awesome. Are you allowed to talk about any of the projects or those secret? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I had mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned our, um, we're doing, uh, we're continuing this healthy runner project, which mm -hmm. is a research study that I started um, as under Dr. Michael Fredrickson, one of our um, principal investigators um, here at Stanford when okay. I was a resident Oh wow. and it continued and it's expanded to other schools, but it's really looking at um, reducing bone stress injury incidents and severity of bone stress injury through nutrition um, implementation awesome. and nutrition cool. interventions. Amazing. And so that's um, with um, collegiate um, division one distance runners. And so we're continuing that um, and have some data um, analyzed and hopefully within the next um, year or so, some of those will be um, published and a little bit more wow. um, available to talk about in the, in the podcasts. Amazing. And then just, um, we're in the middle of, we just launched last this week, um, the first surveys for our female athlete voice project. Mm. And that is um, a cross-sectional survey using this um, Delphi method. So it's a specific type of survey method hmm. that's um, asking female athletes, what did they want to learn about? Um, mm. What sports science topics specifically did they want to learn about to better inform their body, to um, help them improve their um, performance, their just overall wellness and health, mm. and also to help drive future research. Yeah. So I think, um, we all... We all think we know what um, should be studied, but really hearing from the athletes and then using that to create research agendas for all these different labs is a priority of ours. So we're yeah. really um, doing the work that um, people want want to want to know about. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. I think that's great. And I think, like you're saying, asking I think asking people is amazing idea because many times, I mean. I think a lot of times the research comes from your own questions, right? Or things that people are wanting to know the answers to. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's spot on. So with the faster program where, I mean, I know there's, are there some webinars on the website, informational webinars too, that people can check so, out? Yeah, we do. We have some videos and mm -hmm. that was one of our other um, studies, our um, faster pilot, which we just wrapped up and we're actually recruiting for a round two. Oh, nice. um, and those are they're for high school athletes, but these are um, awesome educational, inspirational videos that um, are include content from experts in the field, stories from top athletes mm -hmm. on um, topics such as bone health, the female mm -hmm. athlete triad, REDS, nutrition, the menstrual nice. cycle and mental health. And even though they're um, this study, um, because we need to narrow down the, the population, the studies on um, female athletes in high school, mm -hmm. I still think that the information can be valuable for a lot of different age groups. And yeah. We're hoping to eventually expand this to other topics that are a little bit more sports performance focused, talking about strength training and female athletes, um, the importance of recovery, kind of fueling for performance, not just to address um, or fueling for low energy availability. Yeah. And, and so there are some, I think our website probably is the easiest way to access some of those videos. We do have some reels on it, but mm -hmm. I think reels are like capped at a certain number of minutes. Right. So <laughs> you want like the deep dive, go to the website, yeah. but you can at least get some information from, 
from awesome. uh, Instagram. I love that. I love that. Well, I want to be mindful of your, your time here since we're getting close to the hour, but, um, where can people find you or what's the faster Instagram handle? Like where can people find all this stuff? Yeah. So, um, they can go to the the website is faster.stanford.edu or um, Instagram is at Stanford faster. And then um, you can find me at Emily Krause MD. I also have like more of a sports science, um, which I need to be more consistent on, but I can only do so many things. And yeah. I feel like our faster is kind of our, our main focus, but that's um, Emily Krauss MD underscore sports science. Awesome. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time. I could have asked you like a million other questions in the first <laughs> I half. I talked about yeah. a million things. But, no. <laughs> but super helpful, I'm sure for our listeners. Um, again, this is such a, an area that we see probably too often. And so I'm so happy to, to see that there's so much research looking into this area to, to help people. So I love it. Yeah. So thank you so much again, Emily. This was amazing. Thank you. And thank you for um, nutritional revolution to getting this message out in so many ways and for doing the hard work. Yeah. Um, I mean, it takes, it takes uh, doing the hard work. Of us. <laughs> doing the hard work. Let's be real. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for your time today. This is amazing. And definitely would love to, um, you know, talking about the research with faster and stuff. I mean, and any, any of the stuff that you're doing, I mean, once we get some, once that gets published and you have some more data, definitely would love to have you back. Yeah. And, and Bring me that. back. We can, yeah. go and, we can break it down again. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you. This has been amazing.